Good morning, everyone. How are you today? It's great to see you. It's a beautiful day in New York City and a great day for this discussion. I'm Anthony Crowell, uh, the Dean and President at New York Law School, and it is a great pleasure to welcome you. And it is a wonderful opportunity for us to host this special program uh, with Abney and New York City's five extraordinary district attorneys. Let's give them all a round of applause. I want to thank Melba Miller, Abney's executive director, who's so dynamic and thoughtful for partnering with NYLS and putting this program on. The program comes at a truly pivotal time as criminal justice issues throughout our city continue to be front and center in every borough. And that's why having all five district attorneys together is especially important as they bring the perspectives and their res uh, respective uh, thoughts about their jurisdictions. And they'll offer us together a comprehensive picture of what's happening in all of our communities citywide. I wanna also thank Errol Lewis for moderating this conversation. He's an old friend of New York Law School and there's no one better to lead the conversation. We call ourselves New York's Law School, and I believe our campus is the perfect place to have this discussion. We are a 132-year-old institution with a deep history of engaging on key legal and policy matters affecting our city. I'm proud that we have strong relationships with each of the district attorneys here today, and our school is strongly represented in each of their offices, with many uh, students working there during their time in school, and certainly many graduates uh, after uh, they leave these doors. Um, we are very proud also of having two prosecution clinics with the Manhattan DA's office and the Brooklyn DA. All DA's uh, in New York City have an ironclad commitment to protecting New Yorkers and ensuring justice is fairly and justly delivered. And two of the five DA's are actually members of this community. Staten Island District Attorney Mike McMahon is a 1985 alumnus of the school and Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg was a full-time professor here before uh, taking office last year. He also ran our racial justice project. Their jobs are incredibly difficult from the high profile cases we read about to the significant daily docket in courtrooms throughout the five boroughs. And their work affects absolutely every aspect of our lives as New Yorkers. So on behalf of our law school, I thank them for their dedication to, to our city and I greatly admire their lifelong commitment to public service. Thank you for being here. I will now ask ABNY President Stephen Rubenstein to join us at the podium and offer his welcome. Thanks so much. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you, Dean Crow. Thanks for hosting us. And thank you for joining uh, your community with our community for this discussion. So this discussion is happening at its best. These are critical issues that affect us every day. We're hearing from our leaders who impact and affect these issues. And we're gonna have an honest conversation that one is kind of hard to have at this point in time, especially when it comes to public safety. Crime in our city has become a national talking point and the issue may have tipped control of the House of Representatives, Representatives and it came close to defining our last gubernatorial election. But I just wanna start with one key fact. We remain the safest big city in America, and that is a big deal. But we can all acknowledge the headwinds and changes we face over the past few years, and we really can take that New York over the last 30 years has, has really reduced crime. But that means we have to be able to talk about these issues, and they're hard to talk about them. We need to find a renewed consensus to be the city that we can be and should be when it comes to public safety. We're honored to have our five DAs with us today. Please join me in welcoming them. I'm going to introduce them in, by order of their borough's population. Brooklyn DA Eric Gonzalez. <laughs> <laughs> Queens DA Melinda Katz. Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg. Bronx DA Darcel Clark. And Staten Island District Attorney Michael McMahon. Thank you all for being They are all serious, substantive, and brave public servants. We have a lot of ground to cover today. To do that and lead this conversation, we are so thrilled to be joined by Errol Lewis. Errol needs no introduction, so instead, I'm just gonna read something he wrote recently about the death of Jordan Neely that I thought was really moving. And as we begin today's conversation, I think it can help us reckon with our collective responsibility to one another. Errol wrote, 
This is what happens when the sight of the distressed becomes so common that it is both fearsome and exhausting. We look the other way, mutter about crime and the quality of life, and ignore the fact that we as a society are taking the cheap, easy way out by condemning some of our neighbors to a kind of walking death and hoping we avoid the consequences. Errol, I wanna thank you for helping translate that moment and for challenging people across the city, not to draw battle lines, but to recognize that we need to do better together as New Yorkers. And in that spirit, I'll pass the mic to Errol. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. And as you uh, mentioned, we do have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm gonna just uh, jump right in. And I wanna thank Abney both for inviting me and for convening this group. There aren't that many groups that can get all five of them together uh, all at the same time. Um, uh, um, so for folks, I wanted to start on the issue of discovery reform. Uh, at the conclusion of the state budget process, uh, not long ago, you released a joint statement, all five of you, saying that, quote, thousands of cases have been needlessly dismissed across the five boroughs as a direct result of the changes to the discovery law, which has harmed public safety <clears throat> and prevented victims from achieving accountability in the courtroom. And uh, all five of you call for statutory changes and additional resources, um, but the, the push for change was uh, sort of ended at the last minute. And we on the outside never got sort of a clear view of what the conversation was about, why these needed changes um, didn't happen. And I wanted to start with uh, Michael McMahon as uh, the first vice president of the District Attorneys Association of New York State. What, what, what happened there? And what, what do we need to know going forward? Because the issues haven't gone away. Sure, no, they certainly haven't. Um... I hope, uh, the, you know, it's a, let me just say, it's, it's great to uh, come home to New York Law School. Uh, both my brother and Tom, Tom and I graduated uh, from the school in the early 80s. Uh, it looked a lot different then. And uh, we both felt, feel that if the school looked like this, then we probably would have been uh, honor students. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, Dean Crowell, it's wonderful to see you. And thanks for what you've done here. And to our friends at Abney, uh, Mr. Rubenstein and uh, Melva Miller, uh, thank you. Uh, for us in our roles as district attorneys, uh, working together with civic groups is so important. And this sort of super civic group uh, that's concerned about issues in the city of New York is so important. We can't be effective without this connection. So if someone doesn't think that discovery reform, uh, a reform of the discovery reform is not necessary, then they're not paying attention to what's going on in our offices. Uh, cases are uh, being dismissed or pled down uh, because we do not have the, the, the people power to get the job done. Uh, the requirements foisted on us by the legislature are unrealistic, and quite frankly, they're stupid. Uh, they require us to turn over in 35 days information that is neither relevant or even related to the case in our opinion. Uh, and um, in the meantime, the, the defense bar, in my opinion, is gaming the system uh, by welcoming delays and then looking to get cases dismissed because the discovery timelines are coupled with 30-30 speedy trial requirements. Um, and uh, that is something that has to be addressed because not only is it affecting our ability to deal with uh, particular cases uh, and get justice for the victims and for the accused in, in many cases, um, it is causing massive attrition in our offices. Young lawyers do not want to be ADAs anymore because the workload that they have is so massive and it threatens their uh, professional credentials if they make a mistake. Uh, they start salaries at 75,000. The top graduate this, these schools go and make 215,000, which by the way is more than we make, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but when I was in school, the top students wanted to go to the white shoe firms the U.S. Attorney's Office and the DA's offices. Those were like the top three. That's what we aspired to. That is no longer the case. And the attrition is really gutting out our ability to do the job. So what happened was, and, and really, I'm not the one to speak to this exactly because it wasn't my proposal, but uh, DA Clark started with a proposal that we, we felt would be good. And then the legislature changed it so far dramatically that maybe I'll turn, if I could, well, yeah, well, yeah, right fact, but I could also say this is that there are a few proposals out there, um, and we put forth a proposal which would stagger the timelines so that you'd still have open file discovery. The defense would receive all the material, but it would be done in, much, in a much more reasonable time frame. 
Think about a case where you have a commercial burglar who's had maybe 13, 14 cases and we make an arrest. Now we have hundreds of body-worn camera. We have hundreds of uh, police investigative forms. It is unmanageable. And what we are saying is do it over a period of time so that the defense gets everything, but in a more reasonable time frame so that we can manage the information. And by the way, uh, last week I met with the head of legal aid and she also said, the new head of legal aid, and she also said that her, her staff uh, is, is having difficulty dealing with this material. So something has to be done. I think as to what happened in Albany at the end of the uh, last month, I think m my colleagues could speak to better. Okay, yeah, I know several of you are, are, are board members, and I'll, I'll go to D.A. Clark next. Um, for, for those who weren't following this closely, the, the proposal, as I understand it, would have required that defense attorneys um, challenge uh, whether or not discovery was complete, the, the certificate of, of compliance within 35 days um, or waive their right to challenge it at any other point. Was that, D.A. Clark, was that pretty much what the proposal was? But the, the proposal, like um, D.A. McMahon said, there were a lot of different proposals, but by the end of the period, and remember the budget time was crunch time. So we didn't have a lot of time to discuss it. And quite frankly, the dialogue in Albany throughout the budget time was really on bail. Some of us were, I, I thought that discovery was more important because that impacted the whole case. Bail is only at the beginning. Discovery deals with the entire case and whether or not a case is gonna be dismissed. So my focus was on discovery as to many of us, we had many platforms to deal with. So by the end, when it was towards the end of the budget season, when we finally were able to start having some dialogue about discovery, what we came up with that we could have a consensus is, was about, what we call lying in wait. And what that is is this, just like D.A. McMahon said, within 20 days, we have to turn over all the evidence if somebody's incarcerated, and 35 days if they're out. It's impossible to do. We have not been able to do it in the three years, but we're working hard to do it every day. It's not an obligation that we don't want to do. We have to turn over the evidence, and we always have. So this change in the law hasn't changed our obligation. It just changed how soon we have to do it and how much we have to turn over. So with that in mind, knowing that we had those timelines, we have to file something called a certificate of compliance, which means that we've gathered everything that we need, all the evidence that should be turned over. We've gathered it. We're certifying that. And soon after that, we're stating that we're ready for trial. After that, it's up to the defense attorneys to look at what they've been given and determine whether or not our certificate of compliance should be valid, whether our statement of readiness is valid. What has been happening, because discovery is tied to speedy trial, so within six months, a, a, case, a felony case is supposed to go to trial and 90 days for a misdemeanor, because that's tied to discovery now, if we filed our certificate of compliance, let's say, within 75 days on a felony, right? Some defense attorneys, and not all, but this is what the lying in wait um, aspect is, we'll wait until those 15 or 20 days are over and then say, oh, I want to challenge it. And when they challenge it, and if the judge agrees that it may be something that we didn't turn over because the, because the six-month clock has run, the case gets dismissed. Mm. This is about compliance, not competitive edge. That's lying in wait, sandbagging us. We want to turn over everything. We're doing the best we can with limited resources and, and, and manpower to do it. We want to comply. If you see something, tell me so I can make sure I can get it to you rather than having the whole case dismissed. So what that does is that victims are denied their day in court because now the case is getting dismissed. And also, this goes to defendants as well. Some of them may be incarcerated and they're sitting in jail waiting because their lawyers may be saying, just hold on, we'll probably be able to get it dismissed if we file this late. It should be about us giving them everything they need so that they can make informed decisions on whether they should plead guilty or go to trial, et cetera. So what we did was come up with a solution where um, after the certificate of compliance is filed and the statement of readiness, that the defense has now a timeline for them to file their challenges mm. and not wait until the last minute so that things Got are it. dismissed. And, so and that's what we you're, you're, to do. you're the only one here who has also served as a judge, Darcel Clark. So um, do, does the does the court have the ability to adjust in in situations like this if they think that there's going to be some 
manifest injustice or danger to public safety, frankly, because of how uh, this is all proceeding? Can the can the judge uh, suspend or toll or otherwise adjust any of these deadlines? It depends on the judge, but the way that the law is written, because it's so speedy trial is connected to discovery now, there's really, if you're following the speedy trial clock and the law, it would say that it would have to be dismissed. Now, a judge can look at it, and this is some of the other things that we want judges to do on some other tweaks we want in the law. If we have substantially complied, I mean, turned over so many things or or whatever is missing is, is is a duplicate of something that's already been turned over the case should not be dismissed for that so there should be a range that the judges should be allowed to deal with and more importantly if something was turned over late even with the late ter- um, disclosure if it didn't prejudice the defendant's case in any way that should be something so that the case is not dismissed as well we all here, all five of them telling you, we want to comply. That's what we want. None of us are in favor of, you know, uh, uh, um, holding evidence back. We're not trying to do that. We're trying to comply. And therefore, it shouldn't be held against us that we're working so hard with limited resources, just like the defense attorneys are also losing lawyers for the same reason, that they don't have enough lawyers. Or every time somebody quits, that caseload goes to somebody else, somebody more junior that doesn't have the experience and things will start happening. Cases get dismissed, cases get backlogged, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, before we move to a different topic, let me just mention to people, you know, I, I've, I've actually interviewed all of you before you became district attorneys. <laughs> and um, uh, I'll invite you all to just jump in. We'll make this like a conversation. It looks like you wanted to say something. But so let me as, as, yes, uh, as someone here that's probably the only one that served as an assembly member, not a legislator, because the councilman McMahon and I were together in the council. Um, I, I think part of the misnomer of the discovery discussion is that it starts with the idea that district attorneys don't want to turn everything over. You know, I was an assembly member 30 years ago. Uh, I'm now prosecuting under laws that I co-drafted and drafted, uh, which is an interesting perspective. And at the end of the day, we want to turn over all the information. I remember why discovery laws were changed. They were, they were changed because there was a biasness to it and there was an edge to it that discovery wasn't given until the day before the trial. And we wanted to make sure it was fair. I believe everything should go to the defense. If I can't prove my case with the defense having all of the information that I have, then I shouldn't be prosecuting it. So I think that the, the initial... Uh, uh, way that folks are looking at it is interesting. I think that it should be substantial compliance and materiality. And I think what the what Judge Clark, what DA Clark was saying is true. You know, we we have a certain time limit to hand over all of this discovery. If we don't do it, it gets dismissed a lot of times with different judges. I'll give you just a quick example. We had a case that went on where a uh, a police officer that was involved in the case who we never were going to call at the trial. My entire case was dismissed because we neglected to turn over the underlying documents because he didn't secure his pepper spray. Had nothing to do with the case. It had nothing to do with the police officer's veracity. We weren't calling him. So those types of disproportional response is, I think, the biggest issue. If we substantially comply, if it's not material to the outcome of the case, but we find out something later, there's no reason a case should be dismissed based on those two issues. And I think that's important, but the the main issue is the way people look at it. Like we don't want to turn it over. Of course we do. Our attorneys don't want to be up for grievances. Our attorneys don't want to be told they weren't following the law in a court of law that they have to go back to time and time again. And you're not even talking about the fairness. The idea that, that an order of protection dies with the case because the judge disagrees that the pepper spray was material or not, mm. uh, you know, is is a victim-oriented issue. You have to ke- keep those orders of protections going, and they die with the case. What, what are the prospects of uh, revisiting this in the next, either the rest of this year or in the next legislative session? I, I think it j- should also just be put out, uh, uh, pointed out, that the, the, the proposal that uh, came from our colleagues that had our support for a while ultimately didn't because uh, the legislature so uh, changed the language in the proposal that the DA said, no, this this would actually make matters worse. So that makes me feel a little cynical that there may not be an appetite in Albany to uh, make the system workable for 
the victims of crime, for public safety and all the things, and, and, and justice, all the things that we value. So I'm somewhat cynical about it right now. Mm -hmm. the, the governor did uh, manage to put uh, money in the budget, which we haven't seen all that yet, that will help us at least um, pay our staff a little bit more so we can retain them and hire a few more people. But still, the magnitude of the work that's foisted on us and, and really just the the, the the lack of connection to any relevance of the case is just mind boggling. And we're still gonna have to deal with that. We're not gonna solve it with uh, you know just a little bit of money. They still have to go back and change the law. So we will continue our advocacy to change it. The people of New York deserve that. I think the strongest argument against uh, the reforms of the reforms was that the initial reforms were unfunded uh, ma mandates, right? So this, Discovery reform happened as part of the budgetary process in 2019. There wasn't really any public hearings or any public uh, testimony taken about what would be needed in order to implement this, and that folded right into the start of this of of the pandemic in 2020. And Governor Cuomo suspended 3030, so we weren't seeing the results of the discovery uh, implement implications initially because uh, 3030 had been suspended. I believe that um, many of the elected officials in Albany and many of the defenders simply say that funding the DAs you know, more efficiently, getting more resources to, the, to our offices would allow uh, many of these cases to not get dismissed. And so um, part of this uh, new budget is more funding for all 62 DAs. Um, including the five New York City DAs that were excluded from discovery refunding last time. There was $40 million in the budget last year, but it only went to the upstate DAs. It did not hit the New York City DAs. And this year, um, there's going to be funding for the New York City DAs. I, I, I think that Mike is right, and anyone who thinks that this is going to solve it is going to be disappointed because a lot of the problems is that, you know, for the first time, in history, they took the implementation of collecting discovery and included that into the speedy trial clock. Historically, and, and basically all the other states, there's a time, a speedy trial clock, where the DA has to be ready. In New York State, it's 60 days on a B misdemeanor, 90 days on an A misdemeanor, and six months on a felony. Uh, much of the documentation that DAs now have to turn over because it's not anything material to the case, it's anything related to the case, often now comes from non-police sources. And I think that is really the critical element for a lot of our cases. We have to get discovery items from private citizens, from private companies. If we have investigations, uh, we have to collect um, and issue subpoenas to big corporate companies. If someone is a victim of a mugging in Manhattan and they go to Cornell, a private hospital, we have to obtain those medical records. All of that time is included in the speedy trial time. So if it takes us 60 days to get someone's medical record and it's in the, a B misdemeanor, the case will get dismissed before we've ever um, been able to collect discovery. So I think the public thinks it's only about getting documents from the police, uh, but it's not. Uh, many of the cases that get dismissed, at least in my office, are cases where we're trying to get private um, materials from residents. So if you have a ring doorbell camera and it captures an incident or your business with surveillance, I have to um, collect that from you. And, I, and often that may mean that I require a subpoena to do so um, and the, the clock will run. And so there, there are a lot of challenges. It's not just simply the collection and review and the redaction and all the man hours that that takes. It's also identifying all the possible sources of material. And so if we miss a surveillance video that may exist in a private residence, that could be a reason where a, a case gets dismissed, as opposed to in the past, that may be just a different type of remedy. Are these private companies aware of, of this issue that, yeah, um, uh, Eric Gonzalez, that the, you know, I mean, if, if, if Cornell or the ring company or, you know, anybody else knew that their procedures were uh, inadvertently creating these outcomes that you say are, are harming public safety, perhaps they would um, 
create a special division or change their procedures around. Is that conversation happening? Well, I had a conversation with an elected just to express my frustration with getting DMV documents from, you know, from Albany, from the Department of Motor Vehicles. It can take weeks, sometimes months to get driving record abstracts and other documents that we need to move forward on DWI cases or driving with suspended license cases, the VTL cases. Um, and they're getting, you know, hundreds of, of requests from DAs across the state and someone has to um, finance that. So what we're, we're seeing is that in all parts of our work, again, that's not documents from the police, but that is a government entity. We should be able to get those documents quickly, but it can often take months or weeks. And that doesn't even really talk about our DNA lab, where often it can take us 60, 90 days to get documents from our DNA labs. Um, so many of our cases are DNA um, you know, required, like they, there's been testing or they should be testing of DNA evidence in these cases and uh, you know, backlog in the DNA lab. So we're talking about tremendous requirements of funding for other government and city agencies and who's going to um, pay the, the private companies, right? I mean, as a private citizen, if you're trying to get your medical records, um, it may take you a couple of weeks to get them. And so when mm. you know government is trying to do this in mass, uh, it's, it really slows down the process. But the but the issue yeah. but the issue for our ADAs remain that um, this is running against the time that they have to bring a case to trial, which had never existed before. Um, misdemeanor dismissals or thousands of cases are getting dismissed in our city. I, I, mean, I can put a specific number on that in Manhattan. So in 2021, the year before I took office, we have complete data for that. 1,800 misdemeanor cases dismissed. Um, not for because someone took a look at them and made determinations, but because they sort of died on the vine. And I wanted to follow up on what Dia Gonzalez said. Uh, and it's, it's not, you know, we do arm wrestle with uh, private companies about um, you know, what to get and when to get and sort of getting it to us faster. But it's also, and I mean, we've seen this with all new statutes of, you know, new terms that be defined and interpreted. So the practice in the Bronx is going to differ from the practice in Manhattan, criminal courts, Supreme Court in Manhattan, how judges are interpreting and just sometimes I'll just give an example because DA Katz gave one. And I just think it's helpful to sort of talk about in some specificity. So we had a domestic violence case uh, where, you know, a man pulled a woman out of a shower, assaulted her. Um, you know, we turned over the discovery that one would normally think, you know, medical records, um, things of that nature. Uh, as we do in almost all cases like this, we arrange for counseling for the victim, uh, which means, you know, go going and seeing someone a family justice center in each borough. Uh, we disclose that information because it's relevant to know the, sort of the benefit we provided to the victim. Uh, what we didn't disclose was the receipt, provide, we disclosed that it happened, but didn't provide the receipt for the car service to go to the meeting, uh, the email advising the victim about an order of protection. Uh, that case was dismissed. Notwithstanding the defense had that information, but because they didn't have the physical receipt to the car service and didn't have the actual email um, telling the, the the victim where to go. But that, I mean, that's gotta be the judge's call, right? I mean, I, I'm just, this is what I say. So we can work out sort of private companies getting us things. We can work out sort of DMV. Um, mm. um, there, there is, uh, and I've seen this sort of time and time again throughout my career with new statutes. I think judges are gonna disagree. It's gonna take some litigation some time for this to settle. Um, but I just wanted to kind of sure. you know, just put, put, put that example out. And that may be sort of an outlier in some sense, but in many senses not. We all have stories like that. Mm. Um, uh, and, and, and that's what we need to, to, to clarify. But I can add to the judicial perspective because that is also a, a, a remedy that we are looking forward to as well. So in as much as that we, we have to color within the lines that we have, meaning the, stat, the, the laws that we have, 
the process of it going through the courts all the way up is still happening, but that takes time. With the pandemic hitting, like we would have had decisions from the courts already, not the trial courts, the lower courts that we deal with every day, but I'm talking about the appellate division, which I was on, which is the intermediate court, and then lastly, our court of appeals, which is the court of last resort. So these cases are working their way through for the, the judiciary to, to um, establish what the law actually means. So they have to interpret the law. That's the judiciary's job. So we still have that going. But in the meantime, if we could get changes in the statutes through the legislature and, and the governor, mm. we can do that. Unless that happens, we have to wait for the courts to and, decide. And Errol, you hit the nail on the head. With our problem with a lot of these reforms, whether it's discovery, uh, whether it's the so-called bail reform, whether it's raise the age, the legislature has reduced a judge's discretion many times over. And the languages of the language in the law and, and the, the record, whatever is there, uh, judges feel that they no longer have discretion to make these decisions that they should be making because we know in the law every case is different. And, and the judge is there to make these discretionary decisions. And in many cases, rightly or wrongly, they feel their hands are tied. And that's why uh, the whole basket of initiatives need to be looked at so that the judges get back to having that discretion that they, you know, in, in some cases you may want to direct to them what, what they should be looking at, but still we've taken, and we've seen when that happened in other instances with mandatory sentencing, with the Rockefeller drug laws in the other direction, it was a disaster to take away a judge's discretion. And this is what the legislature has done. They put themselves on the bench in place of the judge and the judges no longer feel that they have the power to make uh, just decisions. Okay, let us switch uh, topics. This is uh, that this is fascinating. I've got a lot of work I'm gonna bring back to my newsroom and say there's some storylines we have to really think about here. Um, uh, all of you have faced um, cases that have a high level of public interest and constituents who argue that a particular case has important symbolic or even political meaning beyond the four corners of that particular investigation or indictment. Uh, the fact that we have elected you all as prosecutors is an implicit acknowledgement that public sentiment matters and is not entirely absent from how your offices are run. So um, how do you balance the need to be insulated from outside pressure and the reality that public preferences do matter? And I wanted to start with you on that, Alvin Bragg. Sure. So, look, this is something I spent a lot of time thinking about before office. Um, you know, having served for a prosecutor starting in 2003 and certainly during the last year, I mean, uh, the the sort of guide uh, line and sort of the sort of driving premise of all my work um, since 2003 is facts and law, right? Just you, you look at the evidence and the facts um, in individual cases, that is what governs, um, you know, where you would put your sort of priorities, you know, a new unit. Uh, we were going out all the time talking to, um, you know, communities, we started a new housing unit, a new worker protection unit, talking to communities about needs. Uh, but in individual cases, um, you know, it is the facts as we develop them um, as applied to the law. Uh, and it's just sort of that straightforward. Uh, certainly, I would say a lesson for me from the last year is, you know, the, the time it takes to do that does not move as fast as the news cycle. Um, and that's just part of the job, right? Um, and one thing that I've, I've, I've tried to do, and so I want I should do it here now, is sort of explain why we don't talk. Um, because sometimes, you know, we can't say anything, but as you said, you know, we are elected and we sort of have to be accountable. And so I've started to talk more about why I can't talk, which is one, you know, if it's a grand jury proceeding, that is a felony in New York State to talk about it. And for good reason, as the courts have outlined, um, you know, we could, uh, you know, prejudice uh, any potential grand or, or, or trial jury that is in panel. We could conflate, you know, witness um, uh, recollections. We could have a chilling effect on witnesses even coming forward. Um, and so I, 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 one thing I've tried to do is address sort of why we are silent. I and mean, sometimes it's like, oh, they're silent because they, it's not important. It's really to the contrary. We, we have a sober obligation. I think the most sober obligation when we're talking about due process issues, we're talking about restriction of liberty. And it's because of that gravity um, that we cannot jeopardize the case by talking about it. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is uh, I was an elected official for a lot of years before I became a district attorney. So people are used to me answering the questions and they're used to being able to call me or my office. And I, I'm usually pretty straightforward. 
Um, but, you know, we, we are not allowed to talk about a lot of issues. And it's interesting because I get a lot of phone calls that says, what does Alvin Bragg have? <laughs> and as I say to the people that call, well, because he doesn't want to commit a felony, he hasn't told me. Um, and, and, you know, there's not some super duper club, right, that we have. Uh, there is the law. And the law is that a grand jury proceeding and the investigation of a case is confidential. We don't have the privilege of being able to talk about the evidence that we have. Um, and, you know, I find as a former elected official, it was it was difficult to get used to, I have to admit, right? Because I'm used to being out there like, you know, let me tell you. Um, but we don't have that privilege and we have to follow the evidence. You know, there's an old legal saying that says, you know, the perfect system is, uh, you know, the, uh, the innocent go free, the defendants uh, get convicted and the uh, victims get justice. And that really is our job. And so it's not only with the public sense of cases, I get a lot of it with the CIU, with the Conviction Integrity Unit. People call me and say, he's a great guy. You should let him out. Well, first of all, that's not how it works. <laughs> Second, we need evidence to prove that the jury would have found a different verdict than the one that they had gotten. And third, we need a judge to decide that we're right about it. And so there's a lot that goes into the decision um, making prospect. And we have to follow the evidence. You know, today you're the victim's brother, and tomorrow you're the father. Today you're the defendant's brother, and tomorrow you're the father of the victim. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had that conversation very often in the community as well as sort of the public media aspect. If I could just say in, in, in Staten Island's experience, and one that we've had that really fits this question, uh, when we came into office, Staten Island was really a canary in the coal mine when it came to the opioid epidemic, uh, the pills leading to fentanyl. And uh, we, in the beginning, our overdose rate was the highest in the city. Now, unfortunately, it's spread throughout the city, and my colleagues are working very hard on this issue as well. But in Staten Island, the political headwinds blow in the direction of law and order. You may know that we were the county that gave Donald Trump his largest majority in the presidential primary. Um, so uh, it's a law and order place. But we wanted to deal with the drug epidemic in a more thoughtful problem solving approach. We started a hope program and other things. But it's hard to do in a community where the politics are much more like, wait, they're using drugs, they should be locked up. Uh, and we've, we've fashioned policies that now 40% of the people close to get offers of alternatives to incarceration, but it's incumbent upon me to get out into the community, get, remove the stigma from drug abuse, explain mental health and how they are all related into the uh, criminal justice system. So in, in a way, the answer to your question is, we gotta get out there and explain to the people when we can, and in individual cases, it's difficult. Um, and sometimes impossible, but on policies and our approaches that we take, it's our job to explain it and get support from the community. And in the case of the opioid and fentanyl epidemic, by talking about it, everybody in Staten Island has a family member or a neighbor or a colleague who's lost somebody to it, and that's what it takes. So it really means we've got to get out and get on the, you know, and, and, and talk to the community, explain what we're doing. And we do that. We all have community partnership units that are out there doing that as well. Alongside that question of uh, of uh, opioids and fentanyl, the, the city estimates there are 1,500 illegal cannabis shops operating throughout the city, um, which not only undermines the few licensed operators that are coming into existence, uh, but there are questions out there about the origins and the quality and the safety of the unlicensed product that's being sold, not to mention the, the loss of tax revenue. Uh, there are questions that have been generally raised about who has jurisdiction, who can deal with it. How are you all d dealing with that issue? Anybody? I'm Anybody? Happy. You want to start? Go ahead. So, you have, uh, more, you have more people in your county. That's well, <laughs> <laughs> so many comments, so little time. So, uh, in, in Queens County, we have about 400 illegal cannabis shops. Uh, we have started to go after the trucks because we can impound them. Uh, and that's a very strong, um, you know, law enforcement tool. I will say that when you impound trucks or you get them for illegal sales, you have to have undercovers that build up onto that buy, right? Because you're not going to go up to uh, a place that's illegally selling cannabis and say, I you know, send an undercover in for buying a, a pound and a half, right? Because they know that that's the arrestable weight is over a pound. So we have started many of these undercover operations, but we've also worked with the sheriff to take out the brick and mortar 
uh, stores as well. And you are right about the fentanyl. You don't know what's in this pot. And when I talk into the community and to the civic associations, they're like, well, but it's legal now. It's legal now. And the reason we want it to, to be legal was because there's vetting done by the state on the operators. We're getting the tax dollars for it. We know there's no fentanyl in it. There's no bacteria in the gummy bears that they're selling to our children. We took down a truck the other day. They were selling um, what they call nerds, right? Clearly packaged to children. And the interesting part about it is I get people who ask me, well, why don't they ask for ID? I'm like, well, they don't ask for ID because it's illegal for them to sell it to anyone. But I do, I do think it's important for this entire room because it's a very smart uh, room that we have here today to know that at least in Queens County, 75% of our overdoses are fentanyl related. Mm. And the interesting number, more interesting than that, is that 50% of the overdoses are over the age of 50. Mm. Because you can lace fentanyl with anything. So older people that think they're buying the pills on the street and they look just like their oxycodone that they got a prescription for, it is smashed in a warehouse somewhere and very often laced with fentanyl. Um, and so the overdoses are much older age in Queens County and very fentanyl related. And with the cannabis shop, you know, uh, DA Bragg started uh, by sending out letters uh, to the tenants uh, of the cannabis shops. We followed suit and, and uh, did that as well. And we're following up the same way with the landlords. I'll just say that the effort to increase police enforcement does not seem to, for me, to be the right approach to this problem. Uh, it has to be among civil enforcement. Uh, the legislature can pass more laws to assist uh, enforcement. Uh, if we want landlords to be able to evict uh, these cannabis shops that are illegal, they have to have more ability and ability to do that in um, the civil courts and obviously the Corporation Council and, and other organizations and law enforcement can be involved in some of the nuisance abasement issues. But looking at undercovers going in to purchase small amounts of marijuana is not an effective way of doing this. Um, the law, for the most part, is if you buy marijuana, it's only a fine. Um, it's not, there's, there's, it's been you know, decriminalized and made legal. Um, so trying to do criminal enforcement on a legal process is not going to be possible. Um, so among the things that I think um, law enforcement can do is focus in on where this supply is coming from. We have to, instead of going at the individual, you know, thousands of shops that have emerged you know, I believe that most of this uh, illegal cannabis is coming from suppliers and enforcement, smart enforcement by DAs and the federal government looks at looking at where is this marijuana coming from, who's trucking it into the city and how it's being dispersed. And if we can be very smart on the supply side, we can, you know, basically close down a lot of these shops by seizing product and by doing criminal enforcement of these major suppliers who are bringing in this cannabis. I believe a lot of this cannabis is homegrown in sense it's not coming from upstate New York, but it's coming from uh, you know, the United States, whether it's coming from California or Colorado, uh, but I think it's being trucked into our city and smart enforcement can um, help us close down these shops. We, we have a, a few that we started money laundering, tax evasion, and I certainly share our initial uh, gut is the, the same as Dia Gonzalez is that, um, and you can sort of see it when the uh, store closes and it's open the next day, you know, restocked and reloaded, um, that means they've got a ready supply chain. And so we've started to work our, our way up and hopefully we'll have news on that. Uh, I, I agree with both of them, but that takes time as well. So people have to be patient and understand anytime these social ills happen, the default is always call the police and get the DAs involved. And we cannot arrest our way out of these things. They've decriminalized it. They've made it more legal. We have to deal with the compliance part of it. They need The, the government needs to be uh, quicker in making sure that people who are now allowed to open these shops and be able to sell legally, that they be able to go through the process more 
you know, faster so that they uh, can legitimately sell. And then that way we also have a safety mechanism as DA Katz talk about, because it's been vetted, we know the product, et cetera, et cetera. So on the same side, we need to make sure that they start giving more licenses out. If it's, if it's legal and people could get licensed, cut the red tape so people can really be able to do that, as well as us on same token, dealing with the suppliers. So it's a multifaceted approach that has to happen. It can't just be the DAs. Okay. Um, let, let me um, shift to something that uh, I know all of you hear about. Um, several of you campaigned on a promise not to use prosecutorial resources to go after low-level offenders, and I'm thinking in this particular of uh, retail theft, shoplifting. Um, one consequence has been that stores are locking their goods away to the immense irritation of law-abiding New Yorkers. Um, are you rethinking that policy? What, what's your role in that, in that conversation? Or are we going to just, you know, be a town where you have to ask somebody to, you know, hand you a tube of toothpaste? I can go first. Uh, I know there's something we've all been, been thinking about. So, you know, Early last year, uh, my office started a small business alliance you know, working with the uh, NYPD and we started with small businesses and then some of the big box stores wanted to get involved as well. Uh, and it just became very clear when you looked at the data and what I, what I pledged was to follow the data always. Um, that So in Manhattan, 18% of uh, those arrested for shoplifting account for more than 45% of the arrests. So we said, all right, we're just gonna focus on those uh, sort of people who are repeatedly doing it. Um, and that's where we've, we've sort of targeted our resources. Uh, and then make case-by-case -case determinations. Many of those uh, people are suffering from substance use disorder uh, and mental health. We've increased our resources to uh, alternatives to incarceration in the name of helping those people, but also in the name of ending the recidivism, right? We've seen it for, for you know, time and time again. People ask about the, you know, 10th arrest. This is that underlying issue wasn't addressed. Uh, and then we've also seen some folks who are doing this as a part of fencing operations, and we've been using our more traditional uh, mechanisms for that. And, you know, while I'm still getting texts for some neighbors about the lotion and the odor and being locked, locked up, and it's a, I'm not suggesting we've solved the issue, I will say um, we're trending in Manhattan in the right direction for the uh, first time since the pandemic. Uh, shoplifting is down in Manhattan. Shoplifts and complaints were down 11% uh, in the first quarter. Um, so we're going to keep on doing uh, what we've been doing, which is focusing sort of on the core uh, recidivist groups uh, to reduce recidivism, address underlying needs, um, and working in partnership with uh, our store owners. Um, we, we had the same approach as well. I had started meeting... Uh, two years ago during the pandemic with first the uh, the big box stores are the ones that came to me first. And then the, the supermarket owner saying, wait a minute, I'm not a big box store, but I have supermarkets that people are stealing from. Then I had the bodega owners, which, you know, we have, that is the heart and soul uh, uh, of the uh, retail industry, you know, in the Bronx. And I sat down with all of them and they told me their complaints of how the precincts are not responding because it's just petted larceny and the misconception that, oh, well, those DAs are not going to prosecute it anyway, which is not necessarily true. So coming together with the police, with all of those store owners, which they've formed a coalition now called CAPS, Collective Action to Protect Our Stores. So all of those groups coming together with the DA's office, we've now been able to identify who those high priority offenders are, whether it's organized retail theft or some individual that just keeps going on and on and doing it. We've identified them, put the resources into them, making sure we put alerts on every time they come through. And the, they had tw tweaked the bail laws so that you can address those people, those recidivists, in a different way so that now we can hold them more accountable. We came up with a list of, I think, like 60 individuals who were responsible mm. for all of that. We've identified them, and like in Manhattan, um, some of them had drug problems. We got them in treatment. They're, they're, they're done. You know, homelessness, no jobs. We've, we've dealt with it in those kind of human resource ways. But then there are others that ended up being held in on bail and now being held accountable, even including 
raising the um, the charges to to level up to to burglaries. That's not what we want to do, but we have to do it in order to stop the scourge that is happening because it's unfair to the communities that it's not safe for them to go into the stores. Employees are getting hurt, so it's not only the stealing when they hurt an employee, it becomes not just a retail theft now, that becomes an assault. That's also part of the crime. So we are still prosecuting those individuals. We're holding them accountable in different ways. The other thing in the Bronx, we we have something called Bronx Cams, which is a community um, camera mapping system where we're asking store owners, uh, property owners, we have the Argus cameras, NYCHA camera. We're asking people to register their surveillance cameras with our office, not for me to watch people like Big Brother, but to just know where those cameras are so that when things happen, we can go to them and pull their video in order to help make out the cases. I know the Bronx Community Foundation last week just um, um, issued some grants for bodega owners for them to be able to buy um, cameras for in their stores because some of them can't afford them, as well as panic buttons that will go to the precincts in order to alert them as well. So we're doing a concerted effort as well as having uh, private security now doing certain corridors with the bids so that we know who these individuals are and the store owners now can communicate with each other and say, yes, he just left my store. And guess what? He's going down to Target or somewhere else. Mm. We're working together now to really identify those who are doing it. And then we're dealing with them accordingly. And we've, I just want to say, as to the workers' safety. So uh, there are certain groups of people when they're assaulted, obviously police officers, uh, EMS workers, there's a bump up to the charge so that it becomes a more serious felony assault. And we work with our local state legislator to uh, introduce legislation that would give retail workers that same protection that nurses have, bus drivers and others. So that would give them some protection. Um, on, but on the other side, in terms of getting the individuals who are committing these crimes into uh, a different path in their lives, uh, one thing the legislature did as well is they, they, they said that in uh, misdemeanor cases, the individual who's arrested has to get a DAT automatically. So they're released within 20 minutes, depending on your police precinct, within an hour. And so the police are looking, well, we've arrested this guy. He went into the Target. He, he shoplifted. It was a pettit larceny. And he's back on the street in an hour. And it just makes it harder for us to bring problem-solving problem approaches to these individuals who are suffering from mental health illness or addiction illness. And so that's why I think there's a lot of people get frustrated as well. Stores are calling the police, arrests are made, and an hour later that same individual is back in the store Mm -hmm. doing the same activity. So that's another thing that has to be addressed. Okay, um, we're, we're nearing the end of our time. We started a little late, so we're going to um, uh, ask your indulgence as we go over at the top of the hour. But if uh, you have a question, we have people circulating with uh, microphones and is uh, just signal to them, and, and we will get to you. And uh, in the meantime, let me ask each of the panelists, how can this organization and its members support your efforts? As was said, it's a pretty smart room. You should uh, take advantage of the, of the opportunity. Well, have I mentioned that Albany has really mucked things up in public safety? <laughs> because even with the uh, marijuana shops, uh, they they legalize without setting a, a, a regulatory scheme. So I certainly think there have to be conversations with the legislators that have to understand. They have to hear from business owners, everyday people, people who hold public safety as important, uh, that what they are doing is making New York sa- unsafe. And Staten Island crime is up uh, 18% year over year. Uh, Retail thefts up 80%. GLAs have been up uh, close to 100%. Even homicides are up by 100%. So the people of Staten Island are seeing those numbers go up. I think that's the case all across the city. In some places, numbers are dipping down, but New Yorkers do not feel safe. If they do not feel safe, they will not frequent your businesses. Uh, They will not come to our colleges and universities. They will not come here as tourists. And we need to change that dynamic. So please, Abney, sit down with the New York State Legislature and explain to them we have to get back to a balanced approach, not a lopsided approach. I think what I would add is that um, I would like to see the, the business community do as much as you've already done. But I think that to help us as DAs, we need to get to the root causes 
of problems and why people commit crimes. And that means, and I know for at least in the Bronx, we need more resources to help our communities in order to get through not only the pandemic, but just you know, the way things are in our community. We need more jobs. We need more programs for our kids, for them to feel valued and understand that they can do a lot rather than picking up a gun, that they could pick up a book, giving them spaces on the weekend and at night where they can be safe. So we need money to go into programs like that, partnering with community organizations in order to bring that about getting them jobs, helping with the schools. All of the things that are the root causes of crime need to be addressed. Because again, we can't arrest our way out of this, but we need community partners. If we stabilize the community, we will we will put a, a end to a lot of the crimes that we're seeing. Some of the safest communities don't have more police, they have more resources. And that's what we need in the Bronx. So if Abney in any way can help contribute to adding more resources to the Bronx and our communities that are suffering from these issues, it would be very much appreciated. Yeah, okay. Teaming up on what Darcel said is my office runs a number of programs that are directed at different uh, populations, some at-risk youth, some youth that are not at risk, and then, of course, our justice-involved young people. Um, all three categories of programming in my office could you know, benefit from the skills and talent of your, you know, the people who work for you and your companies in terms of, you know, job training, uh, in terms of educational opportunities, internships, like we've identified, especially with the at-risk youth or the justice-involved uh, youth, we've identified people who um, could really use additional resources. You know, I, very simply, I, I've been a prosecutor for a quarter century. Um, it's the same five precincts in Brooklyn. You know, the, the numbers may fluctuate from year to year in terms of crime or the number of arrests, but it's the same five precincts um, in Brooklyn. And I've been told it's been the same five precincts for 50 years. And so we we work with those young people and, and people who reenter, you know, who've done their time, come back home um, from those communities. If we're serious about getting assistance, it's that population that drives the crime in those communities and where you can have your biggest impact by working with us and other community-based organizations. And I make it very simple because I've already identified young people already have programs happening that could be easily supported. Okay, yeah, let's, uh, oh, just, just a sec. Let's uh, get a first question in here. I'm sorry. Hi, um, could I ask a question that's from a somewhat different direction? Everybody is, either concerned or excited or both about artificial intelligence. How do you see AI affecting the work of your offices? It's a great question. And <laughs> it's a great question. It's something that I've been asking my executive team to think about in a lot of different ways in terms of how it would allow us to do our jobs better. Um, and also how um, it can be exploited to commit more financial crimes and fraud. You know, the, gro the biggest growing um, crime that I see, especially um, in gangs and, and related are financial crimes. And so we are seeing so many of our um, you know, seniors, but also just regular New Yorkers being victimized through financial crimes and fraud. And I'm very concerned about how AI um, will, you know, accelerate that. I think there's a lot of use for AI, um, helping our young lawyers research issues and maybe helping write some motions and really, you know, allowing us to do our jobs more efficiently. Um, and so there's a lot of interesting um, conversations happening in my office about how we do that. But we're also very concerned. It, it was a, um, you know, there's been some prompts put into uh, ChatGPT, which are very troubling to me. I'm not going to share them now, but how people um, are using it to try to figure out how to commit crimes and not get caught. And so um, one of the chats is to reverse engineer the question because some of the entities uh, don't allow you to ask a question like, how can I kill someone and get away with it? It's like, I've been accused of killing someone. How would I defend myself? 
And so they've been uh, reverse engineering. And I have young kids in um, high school age as, as well as college. And they've been telling me some of the chat um, GPT prompts that they've seen. And it's, it's troubling. But I do think in the legal world and public service world, this does provide a lot of opportunities. And I'd love to have conversation with your members about that. I mean, we've been investing in software for cryptocurrency theft and for uh, a lot of the scams that are on the internet as well right now. I, I do think that a lot of the scams that we are seeing, uh, it's hard to find the, the root, the genesis of it. Uh, and of course, we'd like to use AIs and any computer software that helps us do that. Part, again, you know, part of our job is to balance. And you asked before, Errol, what Abney can do to be helpful. I mean, part of the way that so many in this room represent so many different organizations, you know, to get out there the word that these arguments are not simple, that they are really complex, in-depth issues that we're dealing with, discovery reform, bail, cryptocurrency uh, investigation, um, crimes that involve the internet and involve just getting people's money every single day. So we've been investing in that, and the technology and the software have reached a certain point. I will tell you, it's still almost impossible to find out the genesis of an email from Amazon Prime that swears they're Amazon Prime and wants your money. Um, I also think education is extremely important uh, when it comes to uh, computer crimes and cryptocurrency and cybercrime. You know, we go out and we educate with our top ADAs uh, into the community groups and into the businesses to make sure that they're not falling for false deeds and false identifications and all that comes with the advancement of technology. We, are, we oftentimes will get money back for people even if we don't have a defendant handy, right? We can get the bank account um, and we've actually solved a few cryptocurrency thefts, uh, but it takes a lot of time and effort and a lot of resources. Mm. And for us, the big concern is with children, right? The, how it affects them, does it make them more susceptible to cyberbullying, to uh, sexual exploitation? Um, and so that's a big concern for us as well. And certainly, that I think this could be a, a topic for a whole nother uh, uh, meeting. Yeah, indeed. Um, I see a question in the back. Or do you... Well, we are recording, so we... we... Oh, I'm sorry. Sure, no problem. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for your candor. Um, we're turning to the issue of discovery. Can you guys untangle that cryptic New York Times story from April 27th that alleges that the DAs changed their opinion on the reform can, of discovery? I, I, I said I, earlier I, that I, they, what the story didn't say is that the legislature totally changed the proposal and, and put sort of some uh, 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 trap doors at the end of it that made it actually worse. That was what- hmm? Exemptions. Exemptions, certain exemptions, so mm -hmm. that it actually made it worse and would allow the defense actually, in my opinion, game the system, for lack of a more polite term, game the system even more. And that's what they didn't tell in that story. But again, not the expert. I want to, that should be clear right. that- Now, now that's, that, that's, that's what happened. So when I said it ran out of time, it's because they did it during the budget time and you know the budget was late already. So we made our suggestions and then like they came back to us the day before they finally said they settled the budget. They said, okay, we saw your suggestions. This is what we think. What, is this a go? And after we, you know, it takes time to figure that out. And when we looked at the language, we figured that it would it would make it worse than it already was. So we didn't abandon it. We still want to see some reasonable revisions, okay, that that need to happen, but we couldn't accept the language that was given. They, they created so many exceptions, it gutted away the very things that we were trying to correct. So that's what happened. Right, so there, there was a, a law. They, they, they gave us what we wanted and then said, except for these cases, <laughs> right? So I will tell you that one of the biggest issues my office has is LEO requirements, right? Leo, LEO disclosures, so law enforcement personnel. So we can hand over summaries of what a law enforcement uh, person, agent was uh, sanctioned for. We can hand over what they call CPIs, but if we don't have the underlying documents of the complaint against that officer, quite often the case is dismissed. And the problem is that, you know, the law requires a certain amount of predictability in order for it to be just, in order for it to be fair. 
So even in the same department, in the second department, for instance, where I, where I practice, uh, different judges have different rulings on what is substantial compliance or what's enough or when something should be dismissed if you don't turn something over. So in the exceptions uh, in the law that the legislature gave us was on Leo, was on law enforcement agents. Uh, I forgot the exact wording of it. But it, it doesn't help us in those cases then. And it actually defined, well, you're going to get your cases dismissed if you don't give the underlying documents. So we, we, need, we need some sort of judgment that substantial compliance was given by the district attorney and that it's not material to the outcome and that dismissal of the case is quite often a disproportionate response. And that's what we were looking for and that just didn't provide it. I just want to directly answer what Jordan was asking because this was a very narrow, there was three proposals given by the uh, district attorney's offices about what could be done, but this was a very narrow one that was being discussed at the end of the budget, which simply was that the defense attorney would have to file a motion within 35 days of rece receiving the discovery, either accepting that the discovery had been properly provided or challenging it. Um, the exceptions made so many you know, the, the, what the legislature gave back was so many exceptions that, and without a time frame by which the defense attorneys would have to file that motion, that um, it meant that in many cases they could choose not to file within 35 days and the law would allow that and then speedy trial would run out. This is the lying in wait that Darcel mentioned. We have cases that are getting dismissed simply because we run out of time. The defense attorney waits until 3030 has a passed, then files their motion, they prevail on their motion, then the case is automatically dismissed. And so we think as district attorneys that there should be some time frame put on the defenders um, to file those motions the same way we have a time frame to provide the motion. And they always had the obligation to file the motions as well. So it's not anything new. It was just putting in the law, making it clarifying what should happen and when. That's because it, it made it, the Times article made it seem like we're putting a new burden on the defense bar when this is something that they regularly do anyway because we have to file a certificate of compliance, say that we're ready, and they have to show that we are not most of the time. So it's something that was already happening. We're just saying put a time frame on it so they don't just sit and wait and wait and wait, and then our the clock runs out on us and the case, and victims and defendants don't get their day in court. And, and speaking of the clock running out, um, I wanted to, um, before I turn it back over to our host, I uh, wanted to thank the district attorneys uh, for, 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 for coming and for sharing with us a lot of insights as well as some directions for the future. So, Malva. Thank you. Um, this was such a substantive and informative conversation. Thank you so much for all the, to all the five days. Can we get a round of applause? And our amazing host and moderator, Errol Lewis. Um, I don't know if you guys have some time to stick around. If you do, I'm sure there's tons of questions. I know there were some questions that we didn't get a chance to answer, um, but I want to thank each and every one of you, all of our members for coming out and the guests of members for coming out to this member-only event today. Um, and we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you, everyone.